Welcome everyone to this webinar on UK, EU, Japan digital policy coordination. I'm Harriet Moynihan. I'm the acting director of the International Law Programme at Chatham House, and I'm delighted to be able to chair this important and timely webinar. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, digital tools have ensured the survival of many businesses and minimized devastating interruptions to education. And this has accelerated a social and industrial shift towards a digital society for many countries. However, if societies are to continue to benefit from these shifts, it's essential that the use of digital technologies is underpinned by robust security and privacy standards. This has been recognized by the G7, which together with the EU has discussed the prioritization of digital policy. The recent digital and technology ministers meeting demonstrated a strong commitment to promoting international rulemaking on data flow, including the G7 roadmap for cooperation on data free flow with trust, known as the DFFT. A lot about that acronym in this meeting today. As the holder of the G7 presidency in 2021, the UK is playing a key role in pushing forward this agenda. The EU is spearheading developments in digital policies, including its recently published draft regulation on AI. Meanwhile, Japan has been leading the DFFT initiative since its launch at the G20 summit in 2019. In this context, our panel today will discuss the importance of policy coordination on digital and technology related issues, particularly with regard to data governance and flow, as well as new technologies that support data processing, such as AI. The questions that our panel will consider include why does data free flow with trust matter? What are the challenges facing policymakers in developing new digital policies? How can different approaches to the free flow of data between the UK, EU and Japan be reconciled? And finally, how should the UK, EU and Japan work together to ensure that the rest of the world engages with these issues? This webinar is held in partnership with the Foundation for Multimedia Communications in Japan. And we're delighted to have with us today an eminent panel made up of the following speakers. Firstly, Yoichi Ida, who is Deputy Director General for G7 and G20 Relations at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications in Japan. Yoichi Ida chaired the G7 Working Group meeting on ICT policy when Japan hosted the G7 ICT Minister's Meeting in 2016 and proposed international discussion on guidelines on artificial intelligence. He also chaired the G20 Digital Economy Task Force at the G20 Trade and Digital Economy Ministerial. Since January 2020, he has served as the chair of the OECD Committee on Digital Economy Policy, where AI is being discussed as one of the major policy priorities. Previously, he has served at the OECD Secretariat and at the Japanese Embassy in Bonn, Germany. We're also delighted to welcome Silvia Viciconte, who leads the Multilateral Affairs and Economic Cooperation section at the European Commission's DG for Communication Networks, Content and Technology, otherwise known, I'm sure you know, as DG Connect. Silvia has been addressing the main challenges around the digital transformation in the multilateral arena for several years. She leads the EU delegation in key negotiations, including the G20 and the G7, and oversees the digital economy aspects of the EU's trade portfolio. Sylvia has been vice chair of the OECD Committee for the Digital Economy Policy since 2018, and has an academic background in economics, holding degrees from Bocconi University in Milan and KU Leuven. And finally, we have David Proger, who leads the International Strategy for the Department of D Digital Culture, Media and Sport, otherwise known as DCMS, in the UK government, and has previously served in a number of government and private sector roles, both at home and overseas. In his current role, David is responsible for coordinating delivery of DCMS's international priorities across the full range of digital and cultural portfolios. This includes overseeing engagement with priority international partners in the bilateral and multilateral context, leading delivery of the 2021 UK G7 digital and tech ministerial agenda, delivering multilateral policy through G20, OECD, UN, digital nations and others, leading on bilateral policy delivery 
and developing and delivering DCMS's international digital priorities. So we really do have a stellar lineup today with people who are working on these issues at the very top of the, uh, of the tree uh, with a wealth of experience on digital policy. This event is on the record and it's being recorded. Um, do feel free to tweet about it. Um, there will be, uh, I'm sure, a lot of excitement in the Twitter sphere on this one because this issue is very much at the zeitgeist at the moment. Our speakers are now going to provide five minutes each of opening remarks, and then I'm going to open it up to discussion to you, the audience members. Do submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button and submit them at any point, including when the speakers are making their points, and then we will pick them up after about 20 minutes when I open it up for discussion. So I'd now like to hand over to our panel, uh, and we're going to start with Yoichi Ida. Ida san, can you tell us a little bit about what data free flow with TUST means and, and why it matters? Okay, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Uh, and uh, uh, it is a great uh, pleasure uh, and uh, as well as honor for me to, to join uh, this uh, very uh, uh, fantastic event. And I uh, extend my gratitude to uh, Chatham House and also uh, FMMC uh, colleagues. So uh, my name is Yoichi Ida. I'm working uh, uh, as uh, Deputy Director General for G7 and G G20 Affairs uh, at the Japanese Ministry and also working uh, serving as the Chair at the OECD Committee. So uh, next slide, please. Today, I would like to... to uh, introduce a short uh, history on the international discussion on data flow, uh, starting uh, with the, the year 2016. Uh, in 2016, uh, Japan hosted the G7 uh, uh, presidency and uh, held the first uh, ICT ministers meeting in the history of uh, G7, actually. And uh, uh, the main uh, focus in the agenda was uh, cross-border data flow. And the discussion was succeeded by the uh, following uh, presidencies, uh, name, uh, namely Italy, Canada, and France uh, in the year of uh, 17, 18, 19, respectively. And uh, in this year, uh, the UK presidency uh, uh, per, uh, achieved uh, epoch-making uh, uh, outcome from the discussion uh, with the roadmap for the FFT. Uh, in between, uh, the three presidencies also accumulated the discussion uh, to develop uh, the, uh, in the uh, international uh, agreement on uh, cross-border data flow. And, uh, and also, uh, the, in the year of 2019, uh, Japan hosted a G20 presidency, and uh, uh, we proposed a data free flow with the trust concept uh, or initiative. Uh, to deepen the discussion uh, uh, on uh, cross-border data flow. So this is uh, uh, the short history, and let me uh, uh, dig in a little bit uh, in the, uh, indiv uh, the uh, individual uh, efforts. So next slide, please. So in the first year uh, of 2016, uh, the uh, G7 ICT ministers meeting discussed uh, four or, or main pillars. And the previous uh, slide showed that uh, the, the recognition uh, uh, in the year of uh, 2016, uh, we uh, recognized uh, that uh, that was the, the uh, beginning of the uh, era of IoT. And people are talking about uh, the uh, data uh, from uh, uh, various uh, uh, terminals and devices in, uh, connected to the network and enormous uh, amount of data will be flow over the network and also analyzed to produce a lot of uh, benefits uh, to the people and economy and society. So uh, the purpose of the whole agenda was how to promote uh, the uh, data uh, utilization how to promote data flow, how to maximize the benefit from innovation and uh, digital technology or digital uh, transfer. So uh, we discussed uh, these uh, uh, four pillars, uh, access to ICT, uh, free flow of uh, 
At this moment, uh, we called uh, free flow of information, but we didn't distinguish between data and the information because this is a kind of uh, philosophical uh, argument. And some of the countries wanted to distinguish, but uh, we didn't actually, we didn't do that. So, and uh, uh, what we agreed uh, in the agreement in this year was we promote uh, the uh flow of information across borders uh, in the lead letters and also we uh, agreed among g7 uh, like-minded countries that we oppose uh, we uh, we oppose data localization requirement so these are the uh, main elements uh, which we agreed in the, the year uh, discussion and also we in another part we uh, agreed on the protection of privacy and the uh, personal data and also improvement of security and but uh, we separated these elements uh, in uh, uh, we uh, uh, in our discussion because we recognized uh, there can be a kind of uh, conflict between these elements so next slide please so in uh, in the discussion in uh, between 17 and 19 uh, we found uh, some countries wanted to emphasize the importance of free flow of information, free flow of data across borders. Some countries wanted the importance of trust, including privacy protection. And most countries uh, understood uh, freedom and trust uh, are in trade-off relations or kind of dichotomy. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, in the year uh, 17, uh, Italian presidency uh, elaborated an agreement which uh, included uh, free, uh, the protection, promotion and the protection of free flow of uh, information across borders. But separately, they discussed and agreed respecting uh, applicable framework for privacy and the data protection. And also, uh, we we had the separate uh, billet uh, on transparency and trust and consumer protection. And the, uh, 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 in a sense, uh, uh, they uh, they were very clever to, to discuss separately, but uh, we recognized a kind, we felt a kind of uh, uh, dilemma, uh, uh, how to integrate these different uh, legitimate policy objectives. And in the year uh, 17, the, in the same year, G20 presidency Germany uh, elaborated the uh, ministerial uh, uh, declaration, which included the, we support the free flow of information while respecting applicable legal framework for privacy and data protection, blah, blah. So in this way, uh, we uh, were struggling with a kind of trade-off relationship between these two elements. So next slide, please. So uh, when we uh, started uh, our uh, consideration toward uh, uh, G20 presidency in the year 2019, we wanted to, to, to promote uh, 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 data free flow. And also we wanted to promote uh, privacy protection and other uh, trust uh, building, uh, building uh, in the internet economy. So uh our uh, proposal was uh, these two elements uh, uh, would not uh, be in conflict with each other but uh, they are com uh, even uh, complementary to each other so by continuing to address challenges related to privacy data protection intellectual property rights and the security we can further facilitate data free flow and strengthen consumer and trust that's uh, what we agreed uh, among g20 countries and uh, we uh, the, we believe uh, the value of this uh, agreement is uh, uh, we found you know a kind of complementary uh, relationship between these two elements and of course uh, we recognize you know the uh, data governance data uh, policy are uh, rooted uh, deeply rooted in the uh, social and economic conditions or culture and the histories and uh, uh, various uh, aspects uh, in the society and the uh, country so we, uh, uh, of course, admitted that uh, uh, various countries have various different uh, frameworks. 
so uh, uh, in order to to uh, build up and um, enabling uh, international uh, environment uh, we need uh, uh, we uh, agreed that we need uh, interoperability between different frameworks so that was uh, the uh, achievement uh, in that year and the next uh, uh, page please uh, we uh, of course recognize the, this uh, data free flow with the trust is a very high level concept and uh, uh, we uh, we uh, need to to uh, understand how to implement uh, uh, this concept into practice so uh, in the year uh, in this year uh, the uk presidency uh, uh, agreed proposed and agreed uh, the uh, dfft roadmap which is an epoch making agreement we believe but uh, i think uh, david will introduce and uh, uh, explain the details but uh, back in japan uh, we are also uh, we have also elaborated uh, the data national data strategy and uh, our data strategy is also based on the concept of DFFT. And this uh, data strategy is uh, uh, targeted at uh, improving and promoting uh, the data utilization in the Japanese society and the Japanese economy. Because uh, we uh, reached a um, uh, recognition that Japan is uh, falling uh, behind the other developed countries uh, in data utilization and the digitalization of the society. So we are trying to, to uh, improve the trust uh, on data uh, and the digital technologies among uh, users, including businesses and end users. And uh, we want to promote uh, the uh, data driven society toward uh, the further uh, inclusive uh, and uh, powerful uh, economy in the future. So uh, our uh, uh, data strategy uh, has an uh, international collaboration uh, 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 element, and uh, that said, uh, we will promote a discussion on DFFT toward the international rulemaking, because we understand, you know, the data strategy and the data policy should not be isolated, and but it should be uh, coherent uh, across countries. Otherwise, uh, the, our digital economy uh, will be uh, isolated when, uh, 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 just like the case we experienced in the mobile phone uh, business uh, uh, the, uh, ten, more than 10 years ago. And also it said uh, we will prioritize collaboration in G7 in promoting G7 DFFT roadmap. So uh, promoting DFFT roadmap is already built in our national strategy and we will ready to cooperate. And also we are uh, trying to target a visible achievement uh, in upcoming G7 uh, uh, meetings under Japan's presidency in the year of 2023. So our national uh, uh, policy and the strategy is uh, uh, ready to work together, uh, first uh, with like-minded countries from G7, and also we will want to expand uh, this collaboration beyond G7 framework. So thank you very much. That's all for uh, from my side and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Ida-san. Thank you very much for unpacking this concept of data free flow with trust for us and also giving us a bit of a history about the evolution of the discussions on this over the last five years, including Japan's important role in those. I thought it was particularly interesting, the evolution that you painted of um, data free flow and on the one hand and trust on the other as sort of in conflict uh, initially in, in some of the discussions, but then with this evolution towards a more complementary approach and, and there is not necessarily a need for these to be seen as intention or in conflict with each other. Um, so this complementary approach um, emerging is a very positive step. Um, I'm going to turn now to David. Um, David, obviously you've been at the forefront of uh, the G7 discussions, including most recently in Cornwall, so we're delighted to have you here. Could you tell us a bit about uh, what came out of, of the G7 discussions on this topic and also what the UK is planning to do going forward to try and continue the momentum? Yes, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Harriet, and thank you, Yochi. Um, with the G7 this year, we were very clear that uh, we had two tasks, really. One was to build back better as a result of the 
pandemic crisis. And the other was really to underline what the G7 stood for in terms of our values and our support for open society. So it, when it came to the digital and tech ministerial and the agenda that we tried to set there, uh, and that we work very closely with our partners on, that was really uh, the underpinning uh, direction. Um, but we knew as part of this, obviously data is, a, uh, is one of the issues that we are all grappling with. Uh, and what we were trying to do is really um, set a direction, not just for G7, but globally, where we were, as Yoichi says, looking very much around commonalities and interoperability, because we understand from our own domestic national data strategy, which was uh, a draft uh, published last September and consultation, uh, which has gone on since then, and our government response to that, which is uh, published in May, that this is absolutely central to everything that we are doing, not just within the UK, but more broadly uh, with our partners as well. So for the G7, uh, we were looking really to try and get a, a common understanding of some of the challenges that we were facing across the G7 group of nations, but we also uh, included a number of invited guests into those discussions. Uh, as I said, these are very broad and commonly held uh, issues that we're grappling with. So invited guests were uh, India, Australia, Republic of Korea and South Africa. Um, we focused on six main areas. Uh, one was on um, the secure, resilient and diverse digital telecoms uh, and ICT infrastructure. Another was looking at the technical standards that we need to uh, get right in order to represent the values of open societies on digital technologies going forward. A third was on our internet safety principles. So how do we ensure that the internet is a safe and secure and open place to operate? and that we are protecting vulnerable communities online. Um, a fourth was on e-transferable records, which is a kind of niche area, but has a potentially huge uh, output because still um, most of global trading goods is dealt with using wet signatures. If this can be digitized, then for example, we, the International Chamber of Commerce uh, estimates we could increase SME exports by 25% by 2024. This is a real economic impact we're talking about for a relatively, uh, what should be a relatively straightforward changing in our own domestic legal context. So on data, we looked at four main areas. Um, one was data localization. So how do we understand the impact of data localization and how can we mitigate the negative impacts of it? We understand there are obviously areas where it is legitimate, but there are obviously areas where it is less legitimate uh, in terms of non-tariff barriers and access to markets and so on. So we want to build an evidence base around what that looks like and then what we might do to tackle the areas uh, that are causing us issues. Secondly is regulatory cooperation, where we look to identify again commonalities and approaches to cross-border data transfers. And we'll look to learn from uh, good regulatory practices uh, so we'll be holding workshops between now and September to gather that evidence and, and look at case studies about how we can do it. We'll be getting regulators together to look at cross-sectoral uh, aspects of it and actually the data regulators themselves to look at data aspects. We'll be looking at uh, how we identify priority sectors for data sharing. So where can we unlock most benefit and what are the barriers to us doing that? And then of course, uh, government access to data, where we know, for example, in our domestic strategy, one of our five missions is to transform the use of government data. We've just recently, last week, launched an, uh, a data strategy for our National Health Service, which is around data for saving lives. Uh, and this is an absolutely critical part also uh, of discussions elsewhere in, in um, um, organizations such as the Global Partnership on AI. Uh, and elsewhere. So actually government use of data and how we do that safely and securely while unlocking the value is going to be a critical part of it and something that we want to look at under our G7 presidency as well. And then just finally to finish, going forward, uh, we're looking to expand this a little bit more and look further into the future later in the year where we want to hold a future tech forum and that will look at data as a critical building block to unleash the potential of uh, digital technologies going forward. And this is really looking at the kind of questions that we're not yet able to answer about how we use data and how we might use it in a safe, secure and open way going forward. So this is very much an open discussion about what might be within the realms of the possible 
And then what are the public policy questions that come from that that we're not yet thinking about? So as we know, data is very, very current uh, in terms of ongoing discussions and negotiations. But we're aware that as uh, the data and tech gets applied, not just exponentially, but exponentially, exponentially, that these problems are going to become more and more acute as we go forward. I'll leave it there, uh, Harriet. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's, it's very helpful to hear about some of the quite tangible, practical action points that the UK is taking forward. It's good to hear about workshops and empirical research on the pros and cons of data localization, um, amongst other things, um, but also um, the need to brainstorm some of these issues around data, which it sounds like the Future Tech Forum is going to be very useful for. So we've heard a, a bit about what Japan and the UK government have been doing in this space, but of course the EU has been very active too. So Sylvia, I'd like to turn to you now um, to try and get a little bit of an overview about, about what the EU has been doing to push forward data policy coordination at the international level, including in the context of uh, data free flow with trust. Over to you. Thank you, Harriet, and uh, uh, and thank you for for inviting me at this uh, at this very uh, interesting conversation this morning. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody who's uh, who's uh, tuned in today. Um, I'm going to try briefly to maybe go through the main questions that Harriet put to us at the beginning of this of this session. Um, as, as many of you may be aware, the EU has been working for over a decade on somehow overhauling uh, the regulatory environment around the digital transformation. We've done a lot of, um, of changes around our data protection uh, legislation, first through a directive, then through a regulation. We've been working at, at matters around the distinction between personal and non-personal data. But I think most importantly, we've been really engaged in the multilateral discussion around data flows. And um, I think uh, I particularly like the point that Yoichi made in saying that uh, after many discussions at a multilateral level, both in the G7 and the G20, we managed to somehow uh, eliminate the concept that there was um, a conflict between data flows and trust, uh, but rather that we need to, as a, an international community, work together on fleshing out the concept of trust to make sure that it's there to underpin all the data flows. Um, it's, it's taken a few years, and I think it's fair to say it's one of the most controversial points we ever discuss at the G20. Uh, but also at the G7, it's, it's a very uh, sensitive point. It's a point which touches upon um, very specific values that underline our, our societies and our democracies. And I think that takes me to the point of what are the, the challenges that uh, policymakers face in developing new, um, new digital policies. I think there is one element, which is, of course, the changing nature of, of this technology, the speed and the pervasiveness of the effects of the, of the digital transformation, not just in the economic aspects, but also in the social aspects. I think the year we've just been through uh, shows us how uh, tremendously we need the digital transformation in order for our societies to keep functioning in such a, in such a difficult um, sanitary crisis. Um, and also the level of interconnectedness between countries and jurisdictions around, um, around these matters. So what we're really trying to do at the G20 and at the G7 is, um, is work on a shared vision of trust. And I think it's fair to say that between like-minded countries, uh, we're looking at making sure that values such as the respect of privacy, freedom of expression, and a truly democratic um, access of governments to personal uh, data of citizens is there. Uh, and that is where... Um, where we may have also some tensions and not always a, a clarity and a, and a single approach to, to, these, uh, to these challenges. Uh, I think for the, for the actors around the table today, so the EU, the UK and Japan, um, we do have this space. We do have a, a common approach um, to what are the safeguards. We have common safeguards on, on democracy. We have common safeguards on, on freedom of expression. We have common safeguards on, on privacy. I think the, the um, I, I wouldn't say it uh, the conflict, but the way we need to go forward to reconcile them 
is to come to a common vision on how we express uh, these safeguards and uh, and how we uh, manage to convey the fact that we're applying them across the board at all of the different um, in all of the different aspects of uh, of government and policy action. Um, I think for the future we need to to reflect on where we can uh, where we can continue to engage. And I think um, on one hand we have rather easier for I would say like the G7 where we are. Uh, essentially democracy sitting around the table and, and having already a lot of these bases together with us. Uh, but reality is that data is pervasive. It goes, it, it goes well beyond the G7 members. And, and so we need to look for a common basis in the G20 and with other um, jurisdictions with whom we don't always share exactly the same principles. It's a challenge. Uh, but I think as Yuichi showed us, we are making progress. So we need to keep the discussion there. Uh, I'd like to mention the work that is being done at the OECD. Uh, this is a very important technical underpinning of, of, of the discussions. Um, we, need, we need those political discussions to be underpinned by very solid um, evidence-based policy. So in that sense, we're, we're, we welcome very much the work that has been done by the OECD. And then I'd like to mention the e-commerce uh, negotiations at WTO. Uh, it's a very specific aspect. It's about it's about um, you know modernizing the WTO framework around e-commerce uh, e-commerce, uh, but obviously there's no e-commerce without data flows. So over there, there's also a very important uh, multilateral discussions with many actors around the tables, um, with many actors with whom we don't share necessarily all the same views. And again, it's important to keep those conversations going. Um, at a wider multilateral level and not to just, um, let's say, shirk away from the more complicated discussions. Harriet, I think I'll stop here. Uh, I hope that was useful. And I'm of course happy to, to answer questions from, uh, from, um, from those who've tuned in this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. It's extremely helpful to get a sense of the importance of, I suppose, talking the same language um, and talking about values as a kind of North Star of, of, of these discussions, um, because there is clearly quite a lot of commonality in, in terms of values and an open and global and democratic approach to data, even if there are um, somewhat fragmented landscapes at a national level, sometimes in, in handling data. Uh, also good to hear about some of the more granular work that you mentioned going on in the OECD and the WTO. It's not just a G7 and G20 thing, there are a range of different international fora that are looking at this. Um, so I think that all three of you have really helped to set the scene very well for our discussion now. I'm going to open it up to audience members um, so that we can start to hear your questions um, and um, I can put those to the panel. So do uh, use the Q&A button to, to raise your questions and see we've got already a few coming through um, and we're, we're, this is your chance to really get deep into the weeds of this very important issue. Um, if I may, I'd actually like to start with a question or two of my own. Um, and then um, and then we'll see how many questions we start getting from audience participants. Um, David, um, I know that the UK and Japan have recently concluded a, a comprehensive economic partnership agreement. And obviously the UK is looking at, uh, to do further trade deals in the country. And, and indeed, um, Ida-san, if, if you had any thoughts on, on the role that trade agreements can play in terms of data free flow, um, in terms of, um, in particular, uh, the issue of, of data localization um, and also perhaps the role that national data strategies um, can play um, because uh, both UK and Japan you mentioned um, have got their own national data strategies um, and while it's important to reach international agreement on these issues it's obviously clearly important to embed these uh, principles at a, at a national level as well so any thoughts either on trade deals or on national data strategies uh, David be very very welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, so um, the agreement with Japan is, is um, I think, a start uh, for us. What we're trying to do is sort of raise the raise the bar on data, really. Um, we're absolutely clear that um, whilst, of course, trade deals are an incredibly important vehicle for this, that we want to improve uh, the way that we deal with data and that we want to get the highest possible standards. Um, so for us, this is very much about raising expectations and it's not very much not a race to the bottom. 
Um, we're also aware, of course, that the value uh, in terms of getting this right uh, goes way beyond trade. Um, security is a hugely important part, and Sylvia mentioned the work that is being done in OECD at the moment. So I think we feel quite strongly that um, G7 countries can take a very strong lead in this. And obviously, from a UK perspective, then um, that is always uh, part of our discussions with all of our partners. So um, there's no doubt in our mind that data, though, is going to be the key to unlocking a lot of the, not just economic benefits, but the um, the force for global good. And I think one of the things that we are looking at in terms of the way um, that we look at the data landscape more broadly, not just within our G7 presidency, but also uh, from a national perspective, is that we know that so far to date, a lot of the discussion has been around the risks of data. Uh, and there is a gulf in trust that we do need to bridge between how we as governments are setting out what we want to achieve through our data strategies uh, and you'll see this through our own national data strategy and what citizens expect in terms of uh, how we ensure that private data is looked after in the right way and that it is used for the right things. So I think what we're keen to do is to shift the dynamic of the discussion away from risk towards opportunity to build trust to make sure that our citizens understand that data will be safeguarded and that their private data will be respected but also to expose the benefits of getting this right. And as we've seen in the, in the uh, obviously in the pandemic, the benefits are huge. Uh, and it may be we have to find different ways to do that. And it may be we have to start relatively small on, on specific data sets where we can build that trust uh, and we can demonstrate the benefits of it. But obviously in the long term, we want to be able to uh, really have a persuasive narrative about why this is such an important thing to do. In a natural fact, without data, a lot of the advantages of technology and the transformation that we're seeing in the digital transformation of our own societies are really not going to take place at the pace we want in order not just to tackle the pandemic and what comes after the pandemic, but also build back uh, stronger societies more uh, with equitable, more equitable access into the digital ecosystem and to increase our levels of awareness with our citizens and our partners as to how we can best benefit from it. So I think data and, and the way we're looking at data is, is absolutely fundamental to all of that. Uh, and that I think we see certainly in going out now in a, in a, in a nation that is able to negotiate our trade deals uh, for the first time for a very long time, we're looking to raise the level of expectation and protection so that we can actually get more ambition into those discussions, building on the really solid platforms that we've already got, as you say, a very like-minded countries uh, and to actually see what more we might be able to do to actually unlock that potential. Thanks, David. It's always good to hear a positive framing on data because so often in the news, of course, we read about worries and concerns around data, which is completely understandable. But as you say, there are many benefits. So it's good to hear, hear that positive note. Um, Ida San, there, there have been a couple of questions I'd like to put to you from the audience, if I may. Um, the first one is actually around the analogy that you made about a lack of data standards and isolation being experienced as, as rather akin to the, the, the issue with smartphone development 10 years ago. Um, you made a brief reference to, to smartphone development um, in this context, and it would be interesting to hear a bit more about, about why you think there's a, a comparison and the relevance of the smartphone example that you made. Um, the, the same person has, has mentioned about the fact that it's difficult to align data standards across countries. Um, and we have, of course, talked a lot about the G7 and the G20 and like-minded countries. But if you had any thoughts on that broader issue of how we bring on other countries who are not in the G7 and the G20 um, towards a sort of common understanding or a coherent approach to data standards, that would be very interesting too. Um, there's a separate question, which is um, about the difference between data and information, which may, I think, raise all sorts of broader philosophical questions. So if you want to touch on that, you're welcome. But, um, but if not, then the first question is more around the smartphone analogy and the issue of trying to, um, I suppose, spread a broader message to countries outside the G20 on data standards. Over to you. 
Thank you uh, very much for the question. And uh, uh, so let me uh, try to explain. Uh, the uh, analogy between the data uh, uh, standard and the uh, uh, mobile phone uh, market development, uh, it, uh, we, I, I didn't mean, you know, there is a kind of uh, the commonality, but uh, uh, in Japan, uh, we used to have a very uh, developed uh, uh, mobile uh, application net, uh, market, and, but which was very unique uh, to the domestic uh, market. So, uh, when uh, the uh, uh, operators and uh, also other uh, uh, application providers uh, and uh, even the uh, device uh, suppliers wanted to uh, go abroad uh, to to expand their business uh, in a foreign market, uh, we uh, they they uh, uh, struggled uh, with the differences. Uh, in technical standards and the uh, application differences and even the differences in the cultures and the uh, uh, recognition of the uh, end users. So uh, the learning from that experience was, you know, uh, uh, when we are too much concentrated on the domestic market uh, or domestic uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, it is very difficult to, to uh, explain tend uh, the, uh, our businesses or ecosystem uh, to other countries. And uh, uh, that uh, will undermine uh, the uh, potential of the uh, data-driven economy or at that, at that moment, uh, the uh, services and uh, 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 the, uh, some other product market uh, development uh, of mobile phone. Uh, 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 market. So, uh, you know, the, the Japanese government and the Japanese industries, uh, uh, industry learned that uh, we need to, to keep the uh, international market in sight. Uh, that would uh, uh, contribute to the uh, 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 expansion of the, not only uh, of our own uh, ecosystem or our own business, but also the growth of the international market uh, at large. So uh, we uh, are now uh, trying to avoid uh, to build up two unique system or two unique ecosystem inside our country because the uh, value of data uh, economy or value of digitalization has a, a strong uh, scale uh, economy and uh, it cannot be achieved uh, by a Japanese ecosystem uh, only. That's the uh, uh, reason of the uh, analogy. And uh, the second question uh, it was... Uh, the second uh, I'm question. Sorry. No problem. Well, the second question was around the fact that uh, data getting diff, uh, data standards between countries is difficult because of the you know fragmented domestic landscape. And and while there's been some progress in the G7 and G20, um, I suppose it's a question around countries beyond that and and how to ensure global coherence in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 our data strategy sets, uh, you know, even inside uh, the, uh, our own country, uh, data uh, uh, standards uh, is uh, still uh, unachieved and we need to, to uh, build up uh, the uh, common uh, standards uh, and the common, uh, uh, Yes, uh, the uh, quality of data so that the people can uh, use uh, data uh, across country uh, with, without concern or with, without any trouble. So uh, that uh, uh, we, of course, recognize the difficulty to, to uh, 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 share the same uh, standards across uh, countries, but uh, the date, uh, date uh, data st standards should be a kind of a voluntary uh, uh, effort and uh, uh, also the uh, private uh, or industry led. Uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, from that point of view, uh, we believe, you know, that can be achieved uh, through the uh, sharing the good practices and the sharing the uh, national uh, efforts uh, across uh, countries 
so that uh, the uh, different uh, countries or different governments or different uh, businesses uh, can uh, share the uh, same uh, uh, good uh, practices and also the same bad practices and to, uh, to learn uh, to achieve the uh, better uh, uh, standard setting. Uh, so I think uh, there is no uh, top down and uh, very no, uh, there is no uh, one side fits all approach, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what to say, the private sector's uh, uh, practices uh, are very important and uh, sharing uh, knowledge and practices would be uh, work best. Uh, that uh, our uh, belief. Thank you, uh, Ida san it's, it's a very difficult question to answer, and thank you very <laughs> much for your illuminating response and also for explaining the analogy with the smartphones. Um, Sylvia, there's a couple of questions that I wanted to put to you, if I may. We've had an interesting question from Christina Lando about Kenya and the Data Protection Act 2019 there, um, largely inspired by the EU's GDPR. And the question is, in an increasingly global economy, how can Kenya and other African countries that are not part of the EU participate in the discussions as the policies are set up? So involving um, the global South is very, very important, of course. Another question, if I may, and feel free to pick up on either of these, um, is, is Patrick Flynn's question about whether the goal is to have a broad standardized G7, G20, DFFT and roll it out globally, or to agree on, on data interfaces essentially focusing on specific areas, I suppose, of DFFT. And I know that because of your involvement in, you mentioned the OECD and the WTO, um, you'll have an understanding um, of, the, of the way in which that this plays out in different sectors. So any thoughts on that would be great as well. Over to you. Thank you, Harriet, and thank you for, for both questions. I think the first one is, is one we've had, uh, we get a lot from, uh, from African countries and, and from generally countries that don't participate necessarily in these uh, in the fora where we are fleshing out the DFFT concept. I think um, on specifically on, on privacy and, and on privacy legislation, the EU has been um, in, uh, in constant um, discussion and also offering a lot of, uh, of technical cooperation, regulatory cooperation with many countries in Africa. Um, I'd like to mention that we have an ongoing cooperation with the African Union, where we've done a lot, a lot of work. Uh, there's an EU Africa uh, task force that was set up um, about three years ago, where we discuss, amongst other things, um, data, uh, data frameworks and data legislation. Um, I think we need to be honest and say that the G20 is, is not the world. So there are, of course, a lot of very important actors that are missing from this discussion. Although every year we invite, um, you know, we invite representatives of the African Union or of other, um, other multilateral um, organizations that are not necessarily uh, members of the G20. So I think the answer is to keep, uh, to continue having this discussion. I think we are having this discussion with a lot of countries um, in, uh, in the south uh, of the hemisphere. We are definitely having a lot of discussions with, the, with African countries on how they can best uh, use their data, how they can best create their own data strategy, how they can make the best use of, 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 um, of data for, for development. So that's one thing. Um, on the standards uh, and whether we're going to have a common standard or different interfaces, uh, I think at this stage we are uh, trying to figure out where the commonalities lie. So it's not a question of having a G20 standard and, and everybody's going to apply that standard. That is not realistic and um, it, it's not what, what can even be deemed acceptable by many jurisdictions. So I think what we're trying to do, and it's laborious, and it's long, and it's um, and it's at times quite conflicting, is to look at what the commonalities are. If we can come to a common base of what we mean by trust, and frankly, also what we mean by free flow of data, uh, which is not always the the same concept, uh, and to move from there. So. Um, Unfortunately, it's baby steps, but I think we need to, we, we just need to accept that. Uh, data means, uh, you know, data implies a lot of economic interests. There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of interest involved. 
but it also means that there's um, there's a lot of values that as democracies we hold dear and that which we we cannot give into. So um, we just stick with this uh, uh, with this slow process, which, however, and I think Yoichi demonstrated very well in his presentation, is growing and is is common to to a common uh, to a common understanding. For me personally, and and that maybe uh, ties back to the first question um, we got on on uh, on Kenya, the uh, the main. Uh, challenge will be to ensure that uh, that we have a full uh, representation and all um, and, and a broader representation of actors around the table while we're freshing this this um, this concept out so we need more participation from Africa we're going to need to work on that for sure thank you thanks Sylvia it's good to hear the aspirations for a, an inclusive approach on this and also I think a bit of expectation management about this whole process that we are, as you say, at the beginning of a long journey and it is baby steps, but it's good to hear that there is, you know, there are a lot of strands of work going on. Um, David, a couple of questions are coming in that I think would be very useful to get your thoughts on. Um, Mark Nottingham asks about whether we should characterize data free flow with trust as a top down approach uh, that tries to set standards across different areas and industries or whether it's more of a bottom-up one where individual circumstances are relevant. So really trying to get to the essence of what is this DFFT and, and, um, and how do the different layers of, uh, I suppose, policy kind of interact. Um, then there have been a couple of questions which I think basically are alluding to the UK's freedoms post-Brexit. We've had something from Amorit Conry about, um, about the how, how coordination and cooperation happen in the context of Brexit. So I suppose that's about the EU UK relationship on these issues. Um, and then a question from Philip Howard, which kind of comments on, on the ability of the UK to have its uh, greater autonomy and freedoms in trade policy. Um, I suppose also just generally in terms of the data context, when we look at the EU US issues around data privacy and the privacy shield, uh, obviously the UK has more autonomy in that sense. So any, any comments you wanted to make around the, the UK's sort of more greater freedom in this area would, would be interesting. Um, I'll hand over to you to pick up on any of those points, David. Um, thanks, Harriet. Um, so top down or bottom up, um, it, really good question. I think the answer is probably a bit of both. Uh, we, um, we absolutely recognize that Sylvia is saying that um, there are different ways to protect data to high standards. Uh, and um, that different countries, essentially data is, is largely a, a cultural good. I mean, it will be subject to um, you know, language, legal, uh, collection differences. The key for us, I think, is around the outcomes. Um, so it's to make sure that we have outcomes that rely or result in high standards of data protection, uh, that allow innovation uh, and allow us to make sure that our uh, data regimes are, um, you know, able to operate on, and confident that we are meeting those high standards. So. So I think that that is um, what, as, as Sylvia and Yoichi said, uh, what we're looking to do is take those small steps. And that's why um, in G7, a lot of what we're doing now is really trying to build the evidence base about how we can do this. You know, what are the examples that work? Uh, what are the examples where we where we need to do this more? In other words, where are our priority sectors? And then how can we push forward to do that? So absolutely, in terms of WTO discussions on e-commerce, in terms of the, the fantastic work that OECD is doing. Uh, we have to do this together. Uh, and I think we will be looking to try and uh, do whatever we can to push that forward in the, in the remainder of our G7 presidency. Um, more generally uh, around our relationship with the EU. Well, I mean, uh, we, we're very pleased that the EU recognizes that we have high data standards. Of course, we will continue uh, to do that. Um, but we also know that the UK now controls our own data protection laws and regulations in line with our interests. And we will continue to, uh, to do that too and continue that discussion. But the main uh, uh, principle is that whilst we're not required to have exactly the same rules as the EU in order to be considered adequate, uh, we are very, very clear, as I said before, that we want to uh, raise expectations and raise the quality of data because otherwise we're not going to be able to use it to its best extent. So um, I think as we look forward to our, um, you know, our forthcoming data strategy and how we'll be implementing that, 
it's very much about making sure that our data protection law remains fit for purpose, that it supports our objectives going forward. Uh, and then we will, of course, be engaging with our partners to make sure that we can build on that to ensure that we can get those uh, cross-border data flows uh, mobilized so that we can actually build collectively towards a better outcome for all of us. And I, I think that would be absolutely the case, going back to the question around, uh, from, around Kenya specifically, one of the things we want to do, um, as well as obviously using all the multilateral fora that we can in order to raise uh, our commonalities and interoperability about how we approach uh, our, our respective views to data, is to democratize access into that so that we're able to uh, break down some of the barriers that data localization might have, increase public trust again, and work with our partners across the world, particularly in high growth emerging economies, to build a common understanding about how we might do that and what are the kind of standards that we want to be operating at to make sure we can guarantee not just the data privacy, but also exchange data on those really important areas, whether that's pandemic, whether that's economic growth, whether that's our security and so on. So this is very much, I think, a, a collective effort and we'll be looking to push forward on all fronts. Thank you, David. There's a lot to reflect on there, but thank you also for picking up the point about inclusivity and the ways forward. Um, We've actually only got a few minutes left. It's gone very fast and there's been a rush of questions, which has been fantastic. Um, I'm going to turn to each of the panelists just for final reflections, just one minute each now, so that we can think about picking up on any, any points that we've heard during this discussion, or just looking to the future, any th thoughts you have about, about um, areas of progress and where you see the potential for, for further good work in this area. Um, there are a couple of questions outstanding that I'll flag up as well. If you want to pick up on those, then please do. Um, uh, Ida San, I'll come to you first. And there has been a question which asks a bit more about how Japan is going to be implementing um, its data strategy, its national data strategy, um, sort of building on the good work done at the international level. So if you had any thoughts on uh, or wanted to comment on the Japan's national data strategy and how that's going, that would be interesting. Or, or otherwise, any, well, any final reflections? Um, just one minute, if you can keep it brief, that would be great. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So just a uh, uh, brief. Uh, the, our national strategy is trying to, to set a kind of a trust anchor uh, to uh, improve the uh, trust among uh, users and businesses, and also uh, increase the trust uh, uh, in the society. They, they, we are trying to, to build up uh, data uh, exchange and data uh, uh, platform uh, across the government and uh, across the uh, uh, business uh, sectors. So uh, uh, in parallel, uh, we want to share the uh, same uh, structure or same framework with different uh, partners uh, across, uh, uh, across the nations and so that the global digital economy can uh, develop uh, uh, in a uh, uh, robust and sound uh, uh, growth uh, path. So uh, we look very much forward to working together uh, with the G7 partners uh, and also beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ida san uh, David, I'm, I'm going to come to you now um, for any final thoughts. Um, I will just flag up uh, that Esther Naylor has raised the point about the importance of building trust between governments and citizens. So governments, citizens and the local level like hospitals who don't necessarily have the capacity or the resource um, for, for the sort of gathering of data. So any thoughts you have on that as part of your final reflections, welcome over to you. Um, and on that point, this is really about building trust in from the outsets, from the design. So this is about making sure that the way we actually collect data is accountable and transparent as well. And so that is something very much on the front of our minds. I think comment on the overall point is um, we have to get this right now. Uh, if we don't get it right now, the difficulties are going to be even bigger going forward just because the volume of data and the application of it is going to be growing so quickly. And we're already finding it's difficult to keep up on a regulatory perspective. So we do have to get on with this. And one of the biggest challenges is going to be around fragmentation and uh, how we can avoid that happening so that we can actually reap the benefits of data. Uh, and that is going to be based around the commonalities and interoperability. You know, we will still be trying to promote data regimes that are vibrant in terms of that allowing competition and innovation that offer high state standards of data protection that keep pace with innovation and use data responsibly. And we want to do that globally, not simply as the UK or in our bilateral relations, but as a collective. 
Thank you, David. And um, Sylvia, the last word goes to you. Thank you, Harriet. Maybe one one last thought, and then it 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 ties a bit in with the with the question David just answered, which is um, looking a little bit beyond the the discussions around data flows and and uh, let's say flowing data flowing in between jurisdictions is the concept of data sharing. Um, I think that is something that it's this is one of the next challenges coming up. Um, the uh, the European Union has made a uh, a proposal for a regulation on on data governance, uh, which is essentially about sharing uh, of data between uh, the public sector and and the private sector, and it's important data around um, health data or transport data. And we've seen that there's a lot of uh, willingness to share some of this data, but not always the right framework for sharing it. Um, so that is something that I think we're gonna have to think for the future. And, and at the moment, of course, the EU is looking at its own um, its own le legislative framework and we're trying to put in place uh, a true European data space. Uh, but ultimately, this is a challenge for, for every economy and every society that the data is, um, has some proprietary, um, uh, uh, rec you know, it, it has some, some qualities that are proprietary, uh, but is data always private property? And that is, that is a big question for the future. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's again going to have to balance the, the, the needs of and the, and the, the rightful um, needs of, of companies that own the data with the needs of society uh, and of different uh, sectors of society, the health sector, the public authorities that may need some of that data to, to, to make appropriate decisions. So this is, I mean, I have absolutely not the answer for this today. Um, I think it's, but it, it, it is what is waiting for us as policymakers in the future. Thank you, Sylvia, and, and thank you very much to you all. I think we've heard about the challenges of this fragmented data landscape, but we've also heard some really positive steps that are happening. And I think a real momentum behind transatlantic alliances on these issues, not just the UK and the EU and Japan, but also the US and G7 and G20 members. But beyond that, the importance of a more inclusive approach for the G7, the G20 and the OECD to actually drive engagement with other countries beyond those uh, memberships. Um, and, and I think a real momentum around greater regulatory certainty as well, because after all, that's important for businesses as well as governments um, and society generally. So let us hope that that momentum is maintained. Uh, as Sylvia said, it's the beginning of a journey, but uh, the journey seems to be well on its way. So this is good news. Um, do watch this space. Chatham House is keeping a watching brief on all of this. My colleague Hiroki has published a, an expert comment on our website today with some insights into this issue, and we will no doubt be hosting further events too. So I'd like very much to thank our three speakers, um, a very eminent uh, panel with excellent insights. I'd like to thank the Th Foundation for Multimedia Communications in Japan, um, who generously supported this event. And finally, to all of you as the audience for engaging with us so much on this issue. Our time is now up, we're slightly over even, but we do hope to see you at Chatham House soon, whether online or hopefully in the autumn in person. Goodbye for now.